was six months old. We're in some little town, small hotel, and I fell down a full flight of stairs at the bottom, to the bottom. They come running up. I sat up and just shook, shook my head and shook it off and didn't cry. So they knew I wasn't hurt. And Houdini says, that was sure a buster, meaning a fall, because that's the only time it was used. It meant a Bronco buster or a fall. It was never used as a name. My father said, well, that would be a good name for him. It don't sound bad. Buster Keaton. They now call him a genius. Intellectual critics claim him as their own. Yet he never saw himself like that. No man can be a genius, he said, in slap shoes and a flat hat. Keaton had no formal education. He was a totally intuitive artist, most at home working on the mechanics of gags. Yet he had an astonishing understanding of the power of film. The big screen was his element, and on it he displayed a dazzling sense of cinema. Yet his roots were in vaudeville. He mocked the idea that he did everything himself. He always acknowledged his team, but the vision was his. It was in this house in Pequay, Kansas, in 1895, that Joseph Frank Keaton made his first appearance. I was born with a, a tent show on a one-night stand in Kansas. My mother joined the show when I was two weeks old, and it was called the Keaton Houdini Medicine Show Company. Now, that's Harry Houdini, the handcuff king. His father found Buster joining the act at nine months, crawling on stage from the wings. By the time I was four years old, I was a regular member of the act, wearing flap shoes and protest clothes with a ball-headed wig and Irish beard on. My dad was a, a comedian and a great eccentric dancer and tricks. He wasn't exactly an acrobat, but darn near. And my mother played musical instruments and danced with him. And of course, when I came into the act, then he got the idea of uh, trying to show the audience how to bring up children correctly. And every time I did something he didn't like, he'd take me by the back of the neck and throw me through a piece of scenery. I grew up getting knocked around. A child acrobat who knew Keaton was Charles Lamont. In the finale of the act, the Jenny take Buster and throw him into the orchestra pit. And amongst the drums, the bass drum, the violins, or what have you, with a ter terrific sound of crash, and the audience ate it up. That's where the abused child uh, accusation uh, comes in, which has been made against his father, and absolutely untrue, absolutely untrue. Buster told me over and over again how much he enjoyed it, and how he loved the act and the rough house. There is no film of Keaton as a child, but in his comedies, he'd use his childhood experiences and his father.
naturally it had to hurt Buster because, you know, he's flesh and blood, not a piece of wood. And he wasn't padded. But he was, had learned to, to how to protect himself so he could avoid any serious damage to his person. So with him, I presume, it was like play. I had learned at an early age that I happened to be the type of comedian that couldn't laugh at anything he was doing. I also learned that the more serious I took everything, and how serious life was in general, the better laughs I got. Buster's parents were violating the child labor law. His mother educated him as best she could. He hardly ever went to school. He may only have been five years old, but he was now vital to the act. The three Keatons were hounded by the Gary Society, formed to stop the exploitation of children. Most people, or a lot of people, thought he was a midget. And the Gary Society had to check it out. And this one official came backstage and took one look at this affair here, dressed and uh, costumed and make up exactly like his father, and he couldn't quite tell. So he said to one of the stagehands, he says, how old is that guy? And the stagehand was wise to the deal. So he pointed to Buster's mother and he says, I don't know, you'll have to ask his wife. <laughs> As Buster grew up, Joe could no longer throw him around. Here Keaton recreates the act with Al St. John. Louise Dresser on the same bill remembers one particularly dangerous routine. He used to stand on a table back of his father, whirling around a, a basketball on the end of a rope while Joe was trying to shave himself with a straight-edged razor. <laughs> the ball kept getting closer, closer, and closer. All of a sudden, bang. It was a very, very tough act, and it really was tough. Buzz told me that they were injured a good, good part of the time. Of course, by the time I saw it, his father had uh, taken to taboos so that uh, it was, you know, the timing was a little bit off. When he kicked over my head, he misjudged it in the back of his kneecap, caught me right there, back of the head. And I stiffened and went out and fell straight back. And he don't know, he, he didn't realize it, what was wrong and my head hit the floor first. I'm out 18 hours. Two more children, Harry and Louise, and the three Keatons became the five Keatons. Buster was now the family's main support. We didn't work in the summer. Our summer home was in Muskegon, Michigan. It was the whole actor's colony there. Here he met many of his future collaborators. And to here in 1917, his father returned, a confirmed alcoholic. Keaton had finally broken up the act. He was a veteran of the theater at 21. In New York, one wet March afternoon in 1917, Keaton met another vaudeville comic. Roscoe Arbuckle now worked in the picture business. He had started as a Keystone cop with comedy producer Max Sennett. He ranked second only to Chaplin in world popularity. Producer Joseph Skenk had tempted him away from Senate with a huge salary and his own company. With complete creative control, Arbuckle directed his own films. He invited Keaton to the Talmadge Studios on 48th Street and changed his life. The first time I ever walked on in front of a camera, I came in to buy a bucket full of molasses. In this, his very first scene, Keaton instinctively used props as comedy material. Yeah, he only had to turn me loose in the set and I'd have material in two minutes because I'd been doing it all my life. Arbuckle and Keaton found an instant rapport. A simple gag of molasses turned into a classic sequence.
when I put my hat back on to leave and got the bucket of molasses, he tips says, good, good day, and I start, and the hat won't move. <laughs> and uh, I spilt my lasses all over and I got my feet caught in them. First thing I did in the studio is to want to tear that camera to pieces. I had to know how that film got into the cutting room, what you did to it in there, and how you made things match, and how you finally got the picture together. I just watched Arbuckle do it, and I, that's all there was to it. Arbuckle taught Keaton one of the few things he'd not experienced, how to take a sack of flour. <laughs> I said, how am I going to keep, uh, keep from flinching? He says, Look away from me. When I say turn, it'll be there. <laughs> and it was, and you did a... It, he put my head where my feet were. <laughs> On the next door set, the great dramatic actress Norma Talmadge was finding it increasingly difficult to work. She insisted the comedy unit depart. Joe Skenk, recently married to Norma, obligingly moved them uptown to the Biograph Studios in the Bronx. Keaton was now second string to Arbuckle with Al St. John. He also played many uncredited roles, revealed only by a close examination of the film. I was only with Arbuckle about three pictures when I became his assistant director. I was the guy that sat alongside of the camera and watched scenes that he was in, and ended up just practically co-directing with him. The Arbuckle Company left for California in late 1917 in search of better backgrounds. I didn't know it at the time, but I've turned out to be Arbuckle's whole writing staff for gags. After 12 films, the war interrupted his career, but Keaton spent much of his time in France entertaining the troops. Back in California, missing his family, he gravitated towards another. Oh, Buster, he was, well, the original man that came to dinner. My brother-in-law brought him home for dinner one night, and he stayed for three years. And, of course, Buster became one of the family. My mother was just, well, she was crazy about him. He was like a, a son to her, and uh, wherever we moved, we figured on Buster. I think the extent of his wardrobe was a toothbrush <laughs> which he carried in his pocket. But he was a darling. He was a doll. An important part of this family was Roscoe Arbuckle. To the end of his life, Keaton maintained that Arbuckle was his greatest influence and his greatest friend. Working with Arbuckle, it was hard even for Keaton to keep a straight face. In 1919, Skenk split the act. Arbuckle went into features, and Skenk bought Keaton his own studio. In fact, he bought me Chaplin's old studio and named it the Keaton Studio. All he did as the producer says, uh, you're to make eight two-reelers a year. We're going to release through the new outfit called Metro. 
Keaton starred and meant $1,000 a week and 25% of the profits. But first, Skenk loaned him to Metro for this feature-length comedy, The Saphead, a stage success for Douglas Fairbanks. Metro approached Fairbanks for the lead, but he was making a film of his own. And Fairbanks says, I know who to get. He says, who? He says, Keaton. He says, well, after all, Keaton's never had anything on but misfit clothes and slap shoes all his life. But he says, you dress him up and he'll play Bernie the Lamb for you. So I did. Co-starring with William H. Crane was the nearest thing to being on Broadway. Keaton was now an actor. This Wall Street comedy was not Keaton's style at all. But critics noticed an unusual quality. Much of it he played with a stillness which set him apart. Said Variety, his quiet work in this picture is a revelation. Back to his own studio, Keaton embarked on his first solo comedy, The High Sign. He brought in Eddie Klein as co-director. Klein, a Senate veteran, played in many of the films. At once, there was a new approach, a new way of looking at things. His frozen face became his trademark. Got the nickname of being called Frozen Face, Blank Pan, Hole in the Donut. Oh, I had some beautiful names. Bartine Burkitt, leading lady in the high sign, learned that the frozen face wasn't permanent. We'd be right in the middle of a take, and he'd think of something funny, and then he'd laugh and ruin the take, and we'd have to do it over again. But he laughed at everything very easily, and it was hard for him to be so solemn, you know. <laughs> In spite of the complexity of the sets, the brilliance of the gags, Keaton was dissatisfied with the high sign. He took one look and rejected the film. His first release had to be far stronger. He closed the studio. He went on holiday to Lone Pine, where Arbuckle was filming. And to help him out, played a bit part as an Indian. Back in Hollywood, Arbuckle visited Keaton and his new heavy, Joe Roberts, and served as a good luck symbol to launch Keaton's first release. One week was inspired by a documentary Keaton had seen. This Ford Educational showed that a newly married couple could purchase a lot and in just seven days build a portable home from delivery to completion. My uncle gave me the portable house and my aunt gave me the lot to build it on as a wedding present. Only at my former rival for the girl's hand changed the numbers on the crates so when I put the house up it was the darndest looking thing you ever saw I 
I found out I built it on the wrong lot. start guess me and then I double cross him one week was hailed as the comedy sensation of the year Audiences quickly realized that a Keaton comedy gave them more production values than any other. Yet Keaton's most remarkable effects were often the simplest. Down and out, Buster decides on suicide. However simple this may look, it took immense skill. The cameraman filmed Keaton with half the frame exposed. Then he rewound the film and exposed the other half. To keep in time, Keaton danced to music played to a metronome. With three Keatons in shot at once, the problems multiplied. When Keaton wanted even more, the cameraman said it can't be done, but he did it. The same piece of film exposed nine times. Keaton and his gag men used no scripts. They thought up the gags as they went along. And the minute we found something we liked, we said, that's a fine start. I said, now what's the finish? Well, when we found the finish, how to round that out, we never worked on the middle. We always figured the middle would take care of itself. Keaton's thoughts had been on marriage for some time, but he was far too busy in production. Then something happened on the electric house. Keaton's foot caught on the top of this escalator and he broke an ankle. Production stopped. While he convalesced, he made up his mind to marry Natalie Talmadge, one of the famous Talmadge sisters. Norma and Constance were stars, Natalie wasn't. The wedding took place at the Long Island home of Joe Skink and Norma Talmadge. I know he, he loved her very much, and I think she loved him very much in the beginning. But I think Peg Talmadge, the mother of the three girls, uh, sort of wanted her married and off her hands. And since Joe Skink made the Constance Talmadge and Norma Talmadge films and made Buster's films, that would be keeping it in the family if Natalie married Buster. But at the same time, 
he was a lowly comic as far as they were concerned and not all that important in the business or what they really would have liked to have had for her as a husband. Soon, Keaton had the whole family living with him, most of them disapproving. With the sisters changed to brothers, he made this view of domestic life. In May 1921, Keaton played an innocent man, falsely accused. Four months later, his closest friend was charged with murder, with fake pictures and false accusations filling the papers. A girl had died after a party. Everybody had their pictures in the papers for days and days and weeks, and it was headline news. W.R. Hearst told Joe Skank in front of me, he says, this is hard to believe but we sold more papers on the Arbuckle trial than we did on the sinking of the Lusitania. After his third trial, the jury acquitted Arbuckle with a heartfelt apology. But the industry banished him from the screen. Certainly he was wronged. He was no more guilty of that than I was. Arbuckle was a broken man. As the third Arbuckle trial neared its end, this was the film Keaton was making. Buster Keaton was the last of the top comedians to go into feature-length films. And when he made the decision, he did so with understandable caution. To make the leap from two reelers to a six reeler, Keaton remembered Intolerance, D.W. Griffith's epic of love through the ages, which interwove four stories. He told his tale in three, Stone Age, Roman, and Modern. The stories of rival suitors could be separated into three two-wheelers if Keaton's idea proved too ambitious. It was full of two-reeler slapstick. But it was the last such film. Keaton determined to convince his audience, as in the birth of his favorite sport. The baseball game he was very proud of. His uh, club 
It was a very warped, bumpy-looking affair. And the rock that was being thrown at him was also very irregular. So it didn't go just the way Buster wanted it to go on the first take or the second take. He said, finally, we gave up NG in each take. We'd NG 10 at a time. He said, but on the 52nd take, it worked just the way it was supposed to, and it was worth all of the trouble. That had to hit that bat just right and go and hit the villain just right, or the gag was faked. And then he never faked the gag. Another rule Keaton now recognized. The audience should care about the character. We had to get sympathy to make any story stand up. But the one thing that I made sure that I didn't ask for it. If the audience wanted to feel sorry for me, that was up to them. I didn't ask for it in action. No two reelers had such scale. Yet these sets are not as expensive as they look. Some were standing already, built that same year for a Hollywood exposition. Keaton's art director, Fred Gabori, transformed them into ancient Rome. had the confidence to make a full-scale feature. It was also a family affair. Natalie played his leading lady. His father, Joe, came along with his famous vaudeville hitch kick. And even Keaton's baby son played in the prologue. Keaton played Willie McKay of New York, who inherits an estate in the Deep South and sets off for the long journey. In his two reelers, Keaton had been using more and more eccentric gags. We lost all of that when we started making feature pictures. We had to stop doing impossible gags and what we call cartoon gags. They had to be believable, or your story wouldn't hold up. The train was a reproduction of Stevenson's rocket, built at the Keaton studio with authentic-looking rolling stock. And they weren't so fussy about laying railroad track. I mean, if it was a little unlevel, they just ignored it. They laid it over fallen trees, and over rocks. <laughs> so I got quite a few laughs trying to tr ride in that railroad. Taking the baby on location had been against Natalie's wishes, but she gave in when she was made leading lady. From the start, however, she had misgivings about her role. And towards the end of that film, she was also pregnant, carrying their second son, Bobby. And I guess before they were through with her, they were shooting her behind bushes and that sort of thing. She was getting too thick in the waist. The location in Northern California was Keaton's favorite, Truckee. And the Truckee River played a key role in the climax of the film. Co-director Jack Blystone set his cameras at the rapids. It was here that a major accident occurred. 
His cameramen were never allowed to cut until he said so. Didn't matter what happened, because something better could come out of it going wrong than what they had planned. He was in the river, and they had a holdback wire on him so that he would go at the same rate of speed that the camera was going. And you can see in the film where the wire snapped. When we enlarge the frame, Keaton's peril becomes all the more apparent. And that's all in the picture. Because no matter what, they were not allowed to cut. If he'd have drowned, they'd have had a copy of front of the drowning. They just kept going. And he went down the rapids, over rocks, and he was half drowned with all the foam. He finally managed to get to the edge enough to hang on to a branch of a tree, and he was totally exhausted. An even more challenging stunt lay ahead. Far below, forest and rock add an extra dimension of danger to a stunt which may be the most hazardous Keaton has ever attempted. Buster has to rescue Natalie before she's swept over the falls herself. This stunt was staged at a specially constructed waterfall in the mountains, so it's always been thought. In fact, the entire setup was built over the swimming pool at the Keaton studio. These photographs, which have never been made public, show that the distant valley was a huge miniature, planted with tiny trees. But there was nothing faked about the stunt. Keaton needed all his courage and skill, even though we can see when we enlarge the frame that a dummy was used for Natalie. Keaton inhaled so much water a doctor had to give him first aid, and yet he could have used a double. To my knowledge, Buster Keaton never had a double. I've heard a couple of fellows say they doubled them, but I have never seen this happen. Now, I don't believe, knowing his bust as well as I do, and doing things as good as I used to do, I don't believe I could have done them like he wanted them. He knew what he wanted. His fall was a different fall. He just didn't uh, slip and fall down. He'd do a lot of things before he fell down, you know? And you can't double a guy like that doing those things. Keaton threw himself into stunts far more dangerous than any he did on the stage. He was a first-class athlete. Even his running was impressive. Comedy for Keaton meant physical action. He not only did his own stunts, he stunted for other actors. In Sherlock Jr., he switched roles and doubled the actor playing the cop in a dangerous fall. Uh, and I would say, uh, well, weren't you ever hurt in any of these things? He said, oh, he said, all the time. He said, you see this thing here on the top of my head? Well, I got that from Seven Chances. He said, you see this thing on my leg? And he pulled up his pant leg. You see, you see this scar here? You know, I got that one from Sherlock Jr. He says, and then you see this one here? And he pulled up his shirt. Well, I got that from Badley Butler, you know? And it was something from every film on his body. 
One film required a leap from one building to another. Above the Third Street Tunnel in Los Angeles, a set was built to give a false impression of height. With the street below, it looked like we were up in the air about 12, 14 stories high. And I took advantage of the lid of a, a skylight and laid it over the edge of the roof to use the springboard. And I didn't make it. Keaton hit the wall before landing in the net and was badly bruised. Eddie Klein and the crew suggested changing the sequence to fit the shot. Keaton gladly agreed. The best thing to do is to put an awning on a window, just enough to break my fall. And I can swing from that on to a, a rain spout. Well, it ended up as the biggest laughing sequence in the picture. Keaton's friend, William Collier, Jr., worried so much about the risks that he acted as a kind of troubleshooter on dangerous scenes. Well, I worked with Keaton on, on um, not all of his stunts, but some of the few stunts that each, each year that were dangerous. And he relied upon me to be sure that everybody, nobody was kidding around about it. So, so, there was always some comedians off the screen, you know. And he relied upon me to, to calm everything down and to get it down, to get it right and get him alive. No one could have foreseen the mishap on Sherlock Jr. The only other really bad accident he had was with the water tower. The train went out from under him. He rode the water tower down to the track. Well, he didn't realize how much force that water had, and it threw him against the railroad track with the back of his head. He had a terrible headache. I think they called off shooting for a few days anyway. And then he went back to work, and that was the end of that until about 12 or 13 years later. He went in for complete physical x-rays and a whole lot. And the doctor said, when did you break your neck? And he said, I never broke my neck. He said, yes, you did break your neck. So he started thinking back, and he said, oh, yeah, could it have been? You know, when I knocked myself out and hit the railroad track and so forth, and the doctor says, sounds reasonable to me. <laughs> in Sherlock Jr., Buster plays detective. Here, he shadows his suspect. The film faced him with a dilemma. It was full of impossible gags, and Keaton had to find a story to justify them. Now, I laid out a few of these tricks, some of the tricks I knew from the stage. When I got that batch of stuff together, and I said, I can't do it and tell a legitimate story. Because it's there are illusions, and there are some of them are clown gags, some Houdini, some chingling foo. It's got to come in a dream. To get what we're after, you've got to be a projectionist in a projecting room. Once you fall asleep, you visualize you, yourself as one of the important characters in the picture you're showing. And go down out of that projecting room go right down there, walk up on the screen, and become a part of it. Now you tell your whole story. I think the reason we started off on that story is because I had one of the best cameramen in, in the picture business, Elgin Leslie. He originally was with Senna. Leslie's task was straightforward to begin with. The picture on the screen here is part of the theater set, lit to look like a movie. So is this. The two simply cut together. It's more complicated when the scene changes to an exterior. Now Leslie had to film screen and theatre separately on the same strip of film. To match the scenes precisely, he had to use surveyor's instruments. The picture was a success. It grossed nearly half a million. Yet, 
critics said it lacked originality and ingenuity. No wonder Keaton and his gag men had a creative block when they tried to think of an idea for their next comedy. When it came, it came by chance, a very strange chance. In 1919, alleged Bolsheviks were rounded up and deported to Russia on a ship called the Buford. In 1924, the ship was due to be scrapped when Fred Gabori came across it in San Francisco. And Keaton chartered it for $25,000 from the shipping board. He and his gag men worked out a story centered on the liner. Foreign agents set the deserted ship adrift. But is it deserted? Two socialites are stranded aboard, each convinced they are not alone. We finally met. Neither one has ever been in the kitchen in their lives. She wouldn't know how to make a cup of tea. He's worse. I mean, you, you can't get two more helpless people. Well, that's all, all you set out to do is to survive. Helpless or not, Buster has to learn deep sea diving to stop the ship sinking. Keaton insisted on doing the part himself, even though diving in those days was so hazardous. The cameras also went down in a special box, submerged in Lake Tahoe, where the water was crystal clear. One of my worst problems in Tahoe was the water. So cold that I could only stay down about 30 minutes at a time. It'd go right through you. The cold also caused the glass panel of the camera box to mist up. Ice had to be packed around the cameraman. It took four weeks to complete the sequence. Drifting to the South Seas, the ship is attacked by cannibals.
When the cannibals finally seize the ship, the couple take to the open sea. Keaton and his team started the Navigator without an idea. They ended it with a triumph. This was Keaton's most successful comedy. It put him with Chaplin and Harold Lloyd as one of the top three comedians. Yet his finest work was still to come.